Welcome to Cafe Philosophy, a program dedicated to the discussion of great ideas and problems. I'm Dr. Michael Picard, and our topic this week is the venerable and impenetrable mind-body problem, that central puzzle at the heart of all philosophy, but especially modern philosophy. It's a hard nut to crack, to be sure, for it has been tested not only on the sharpest minds of history, but on the teeth of time itself. In order to tackle this eternal riddle, I had a conversation with distinguished Canadian psychologist Charles Tolman, emeritus professor of the theory and history of psychology at the University of Victoria and currently a fellow at the Centre for the Studies in Religion and Society at the University of Victoria. He has a long and much credentialed scholarly history, but rather than impress you with that, we shall jump in at once and wrestle this bear of an enigma. So join us as we begin another show of Café Philosophy. Who am I? What am I? How does my mind differ from my body? These questions pose the perennial quandary known as the mind-body problem. Who are you really? Are you your mind or your body? Or are these perhaps the same, the mind and all mental processes being identical to the physiological functioning of brain and body? What really is the nature of mind? understood here in its widest possible sense, the way it was understood by René Descartes, that great 17th century French riddler who kick-started modern philosophy. For Descartes, mind was not just rational thought or intellect, but perceptions, experiences, feeling, imagination, any state of consciousness or mental activity at all. This we call mind. But what is it, really? What is the nature of consciousness? How does consciousness and conscious subjective experience fit together with the scientific view of the human body and of the natural world? These were Descartes' questions, and they are questions that remain with us today. What's more, Descartes' answers, his theories about the nature of mind and matter, have also exerted a tremendous influence on today's thinking, on modern philosophy, on scientific psychology, and even on the deep-seated beliefs of everyday people who also contemplate these great and traditional difficulties. Descartes' answers and theories are alive and well, so Descartes' philosophy is a good place for us to start. Descartes' philosophy is called dualism. Mind and matter are wholly separate substances. They are distinct kinds of things. They interact, but they are not alike or identical. In fact, they exclude each other fully. Nothing physical is mental, nothing mental is physical. Let's look at matter first. For Descartes, matter was not simply given, it had to be defined. The essence of matter he considered to be extension. Matter was whatever was extended in space, whatever took up room, whatever had breadth, width, or depth. For instance, our bodies take up room. The universe fills all space, so these are correctly classified as material by Descartes' definition. Matter is extension. A little abstract, bookish perhaps, but brilliant, because it met a crucial need in the rise of early modern science. The reason it met this need is that extension is quantifiable. It is measurable, observable, with great exactitude. Early modern science demanded such methodological rigor. Galileo had said that the book of nature was written in the language of mathematics. The laws of motion which Galileo had worked out and which were later incorporated into Newton's theory of gravitation, were themselves quantitative in nature and based in part on geometrical proofs. Descartes' definition of matter as extension, in a way, suggested all these contemporary scientific accomplishments. One major way Descartes himself contributed to scientific advance was by inventing methods that became the XY axis, familiar from high school geometry. It's even called the Cartesian plane after Descartes. And it is a way to treat geometrical shapes as numbers, as sets of numbers. And what, after all, is geometry? It's the science of extension. And extension, we have seen, is the essence of matter. So Descartes' philosophy of nature, his theory of matter, went to the very heart of the emerging scientific worldview with its insistence on quantitative methods. 
But what about mind, the other half of Descartes' dualism? What is that? And how does it fit in with this scientific picture of the world? I think, therefore, I am. Descartes' eternal one-line argument. The first principle of his entire system of the world meant to prove the existence of the I, or the self, or mind. But beyond existence, the essence of the mind is also hinted at by Descartes' famous axiom. The definition of the mind for Descartes was thinking, thought, mental activity, feelings, impressions, perceptions, memories, dreams, anxieties, passions, any form of consciousness. All these mental representations were the business of the mind. Its key activity was to have ideas. The nature of the mind was to think in its widest possible sense. So, if the essence of matter was extension, the essence of mind was thought or consciousness. And here lies the crux of Descartes' dualism, because consciousness and matter occur separately. Thought and extension wholly exclude each other. Thought and consciousness take up no space. Matter and extension have no ideas and do not think. The very terms by which they are described do not compare. And this is the beginning of the problems for Descartes' theory. The I think, therefore I am, I think captures the most important uh, thing about the mind, and that is that it is a thinking thing. And uh, since it is an exclusively thinking thing, it uh, sets itself over against those things about which it thinks. And uh, it's uh, from that that uh, we get the, his dualism between uh, the mind and material objects about which it thinks. So the mind is one thing and the body is a wholly separate right. thing? Yes. Um, generally speaking, uh, it's also the Cartesian view here is also the popular view uh, even today, and that is that the mind is um, something, well, that thinks. It's uh, in the head, behind the eyeballs, and uh, thus separated from those things which it thinks about, the you know, buses and houses and schools and going to class and what have you, uh, which of course exist outside of the body. Descartes was uh, writing in the period of the, the 17th century rise of modern science, um, and uh, this was perhaps best characterized by Newtonian physics, uh, in which we have a world of uh, material things largely uh, described in mathematical terms um, and uh, thought of as very objective and um, generally in ways that uh, we would not characterize our own minds ourselves and uh, so it seemed quite natural that the, the mind which apprehends all of this had to be somehow different from uh, that which it apprehends. Um, Right, it's hard to it's hard to imagine uh, a mathematics of the mind or uh, right. quantifying ideas or measuring feelings. Yeah, I think this this became um, uh, uh, institutionalized, as it were, in the uh, the doctrine of the primary and secondary qualities, where the primary qualities uh, were those things, their qualities which belonged to nature and were largely characterized by the fact that they could be measured length and extension, or extension and weight and things like that. Whereas the kinds of qualities that were not measurable uh, were often thought to be properties of the mind and, in, and imposed upon the objects. And these were things like color, uh, smell, and that sort of thing. The distinction Professor Tolman mentioned between primary and secondary qualities goes back all the way to Galileo, the precursor of Descartes. It's really a part of the scientific worldview. The qualities in question are perceptual qualities, like colors, sounds, shapes, smells, and weight. Primary qualities are quantifiable, and they were thought to exist in the things themselves, like the shape or mass of an object. They were objective, and science could study them. The secondary qualities, by contrast, were more subjective. Like color and sound, it was difficult to say that these were simply qualities in outside objects. When a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? If you say no, you're thinking of sound as a subjective experience, as a secondary quality. 
If you say yes, you are thinking of sound not as a subjective experience, but as a primary quality, as measurable waves that travel through the air, whether or not they eventually land on someone's ear. Similarly, color is a secondary quality, because it is partly subjective. It depends upon the mind. When we look at the sky, the sense of blue we see is not really in the sky. But the mind perceives it there, it paints it there, it projects it there, in reaction to light of a certain kind hitting the retina. The same sense of blue can be recreated wholly in the mind by stimulating the right brain centers. This subjective experience of blueness is not measurable like light waves are, it can't be directly observed by scientists, and it's not objective. In short, Secondary qualities are ideas. They exist in the mind. But primary qualities are objective. They exist in objects. The mind may have ideas of primary qualities, but it only ever comes into direct contact with its own ideas, not with things. The primary-secondary distinction really comes down to this marvelous view, that we are only ever immediately aware of the contents of our own mind. The outside world is known to us only indirectly, when it causes certain ideas to happen in our minds. The mind thinks in ideas. It thinks of things only through ideas. We are separated from the physical world by a thin veil of experience, a film of consciousness, a layer of ideas or mental representations. This is mind-body dualism. And all of this is a consequence of Descartes' form of dualism and the idea that the mind entirely excludes matter. While Professor Tolman profoundly disagrees with dualism, he acknowledges that such a widely shared belief in dualism must have something right about it. The world is filled with objects and the mind is filled with representations of objects. Um, and surely this is right in the sense that uh, I can be observing you uh, at this moment and um, an hour from now when you're gone I can be reflecting on this, thinking about you when you're not here and I must be uh, thinking in some kind of representations uh, that are something that represents you. Uh, so I think, yes, that, that's right, that uh, we do think in representations. But if this is where the theory is right, where does dualism go wrong? This is the question I put to Professor Tolman. He told me that the problem, as he sees it, concerns truth itself, perhaps the deepest of all philosophical mysteries. Dualism requires a theory of truth, and the theory that springs forth from it, and from the doctrine of primary and secondary qualities, is called the correspondence theory, which says that my thoughts are correct, my ideas true, when they correspond to or match the external reality I'm thinking about. It's a simple yet profound idea, and it seems very plausible, yet according to my guest, it has a fatal flaw. It's obviously important, uh, insofar as thinking is important in our lives, that th these thoughts somehow uh, match the, the things being represented. That is, that the representations are good, they're true representations, accurate representations. And... Um, this is where the theory, of course, gets into trouble. What we're talking about here, I guess, is a theory of truth that arises out of this mind-body problem. Uh, a true belief, a true thought, is what occurs when, when the thought corresponds to the, to the reality. So I think <clears throat> that there's a, a, a cat on the mat, and lo and behold, there really is a cat on the mat. Mm -hmm. Now, you're saying that this correspondence theory of truth is problematic in some way? Why is that? Well, the, the theory is problematic in, um, in that it's very difficult to establish the, the correspondence. Uh, and this problem arises in this particular theory of the mind because it also claims that what I have direct access to is not the object but to only to my representation of it, so that when I think about you, I, I, I think about, my, I'm using my representation, that's what I have before me, and uh, this is even to the extent of when I perceive you, that I perceive a representation of you. So I'm sitting here right now, and you're looking at me, but in a cer certain sense, if we accept this mind-body dualism, 
it's not me you directly see. You only are ever aware of, of contents of your own mind. Right. This is uh, also called a, a causal theory of uh, perception in which uh, it's assumed that the object out there causes something in my retina and ultimately in my brain which produces the representation which is what I then deal with when, I, when I'm thinking or when I'm perceiving. And um, the, the, the problem here is uh, since all that I have access to are my representations, whether it's an, uh, of an object being perceived or an object being thought about, um, I, and I don't have access to the object independent of those representations, then I really have no means to assure myself that the representation is a true representation, that is, matches or corresponds to the object which it claims to represent. The argument so far has been that dualism self-destructs. It demands a correspondence theory of truth, but can never prove correspondence, because our mind can directly access only one side of the equation. In short, Dualism leaves the mind isolated. It leaves us trapped inside our subjective experience and our own individuality. The whole social side of our existence is neglected, our relations with others, our interactions with others. Descartes tried to found his whole world system upon the private subjective experiences of an individual mind. The missing social reality is where Professor Tolman seeks to repair Descartes' divisive dualism. Descartes had a view of the human individual as, as uh, completely isolated from the world. In fact, uh, there are a number of places in his own writings in which he um, uh, speaks negatively of things accomplished by many people. The best things are always accomplished by single individuals working completely alone. And of course, we know he did his own work uh, mainly lying in bed. The role of other people is, um, is negligible in Descartes' thinking. And um, the, the position that I've outlined as a solution to the Cartesian view of the mind, or the problems that arise from it, <coughs> uh, is, a, is a very social one. It says that we are essentially social. We are not isolated. We are not individual in the, the Cartesian sense. Uh, we have, if we, we are individuals, but we have our individuality only in and through other people. Uh, just as I can speak a language only with other people. Language was intended for communication, not uh, something that I do by myself. And just as actions uh, also are things that take place in spaces that are occupied by other people. For one thing, they have meanings, and uh, um, th these meanings uh, require a, a, a meaning community or a language community or to, to understand what I am doing. I only understand what I am doing because what I am doing is understood by others. So what I'm saying is we, we've moved from an essentially isolated individual for whom social relations are now pro, are, were problematic to an individual which is uh, essentially social and for which isolation is now problematic. So here we have a new idea. We are individuals only through our relations with other people. We are bound to others by vital mental functions like language and communication. And our self-identity is inextricably bound up with the identity of others. This essentially social conception of individuals is poles apart from Descartes' idea of the individual mind, which is only ever immediately aware of its private contents or experiences. The question that arises is this. How is this social conception of the individual supposed to resolve the problem of dualism? The answer is that social action neatly crosses the great divide set up by dualism between matter and mind, between the objective value-free world and the subjective meaningful world. The difficulty with dualism was one of comparison. How do we compare the mental version of events with the actual physical versions in the world? when the terms of physics and those of subjective psychology do not overlap. But when the individual mind is construed against the backdrop of a social reality, instead of a natural world or the world of physics, comparison once again becomes possible. The individual in society is an agent or actor. He or she acts or interacts, cooperates and competes, commands and obeys, speaks and listens, communicates and conceals. 
these actions are social actions that are inherently meaningful. And they connect and relate us to other people in a multitude of very real ways. A social agent does not exist in the value-free world of fundamental physics, but in a social world constituted by actual people, together with objective roles and institutions. To see the contrast, ask yourself this. Where does social action exist in Descartes' worldview? Not in matter, the physical world, where all motion was mere mechanical activity, like natural clockwork, and not in the mind either, for everything in the mind is private, whereas social action is public. And that is the nub of it. Social action is public and meaningful. For Descartes, by contrast, the only inherently meaningful thing was an idea, the private content of someone's mind. Social action is objective and real, but not reducible to quantitative notions. It is also subjective and relational, part of the fabric of our mental lives, even our own identities. With the primacy of action, not of pure thought as in Descartes, Professor Tolman seeks to slay the dragon of dualism. When we move uh, the focus here from, from, say, pure thought to action, um, the problem, I think, begins to resolve itself because clearly action is not divor divorced from, uh, from objects. Action is uh, quite easily seen as that which connects me to the world. Uh, I can still assert that I have ideas I ha and there are the, there's the world about which I have ideas, but since all of this originates or, uh, in, in, in action, at least the ideas originate in action, I've got a natural bridge between the two. I don't have to deny that the, the two things exist. I don't thereby create a dualism because uh, I've got a natural bridge uh, between the two. Action, then, is primary, but not a primary property in the old sense. Action connects minds to the world of things and other people. It takes place in a social space, not a geometric space. And thought is no longer behind action, but in it. Thought is inseparable from action. In a sense, we cannot act without thinking. We ask ourselves whether we can think without acting. And I think the answer is pretty clearly yes, of course. That's exactly what thinking is. I, I suspend action and I stop and think about things. On the other hand, I could ask the question whether I ever act without thinking. Now, we're <coughs> fond of saying that people act without thinking, but in fact, we don't mean that. I think if we reflect on actual instances in which we use that phrase, acting without thinking, we'll see that... There, the person is not acting without thinking at all. The person is acting without the kinds of thoughts that you feel are appropriate, without due regard for this, that, or the other thing. But in fact, if we reflect on our actions, we will see that our actions are always accompanied by thought, and in fact, that's what characterizes actions as opposed to, say, reflexes. Uh, they are, we say that actions are intentional. They are inherently meaningful, and we are... We are thinking is, is a part of acting. For Professor Tolman, there is a still closer connection between thought and social action. For him, thought itself is a social action. And now what we call thinking is, uh, is really a, a participation in something that we do with other people. Just as we're having this conversation now, we're thinking together. And uh, I think this is um, the way human thought is intended to be done. I mean, this is the way it evolved. Evolution? What's that? Biology coming up in a sociological view of human nature? Exactly. Just as the individual need not be viewed in isolation from other people, so the social world need not be viewed in isolation from nature. Professor Tolman explained how thought and social action may have co-evolved in the process of human evolution. And I think the evolutionary picture would be one in which the, um, the crucial changes that led to a thinking animal, as humans are as opposed to other kinds of animals, these crucial changes were crucial changes in action, the way action was carried out, and the way that um, a reflection of some sort gradually is introduced into action 
which becomes thought, which becomes meaning, which then can be detached from action and thought separately. And that, of course, is a great advantage, too, for humans, that they can, can suspend action and think about it and then come back and continue what they're doing. In the way you're describing things, action has some kind of primary role. So we we are understood primarily at, or originally as beings which do things in the world, uh, interact with other beings, uh, perhaps, uh, look for food in the environment. Uh, and those are actions which have a, a clear meaning for us. And uh, thought is... Uh, is is really inseparable from those things. We can't uh, hunt for food without some kind of thought about what we're about food and about what we're looking for. So this is very different from the earlier picture that we had from Descartes, that that uh, where action might have been understood as just some kind of physical activity that takes place in space, and all the meaning would have to exist in the mind. Yeah, you can see this in, in, in Descartes' theory. When he came to talk about action, human action, he talked of the human as a machine, so that there was absolutely no distinction between what a human did in principle from what a machine did or a mouse does or a cockroach does. The difference was not in the doing, it was in the thought that lay behind the doing that made the, the, the hum, human different. Uh, and uh, I'm saying something very different here, and that is that the ac human action is itself very different than the action of a machine, the action of a cockroach. Uh, in fact, I think um, <clears throat> technically we would uh, not want to call what a machine does or what a cockroach does action. We call it movement or perhaps behavior. Uh, but uh, and reserve the, the term action for what humans do, which is r intentional. But don't we get into this paradox then that that the meanings of the words are outside of our mind, that the meaning isn't in the head? Doesn't yes. that strike you as a paradox? No, um, because uh, for one thing we have to recognize that the, that meaningful action is something that I always do with other people. This is a, it's public, as you say, and not just because other people look at it, can see it, but because what I am doing is part of something that they are doing. It's, uh, we're talking about uh, social practices. Language is a good example. Language is a social practice, and there's no way I can use language that does not involve or imply the existence of other people. Uh, it, to, for me to say anything as I'm speaking now is really to participate in some kind of a social practice. I don't do it all by myself. So th this would suggest that, yes, the meanings are located somewhere in, in some kind of a social space, not, not inside my head. Um, I don't see any problem with that. In fact, it seems to solve a lot of problems with respect to meaning. We see how even the social conception of the mind and the individual is not without paradoxes and difficulties. If action is inherently meaningful, but as action does not exist wholly inside the head, then doesn't meaning also dwell outside mind? Professor Tolman sees no problem here, but you are free to think for yourself and to come to your own conclusions. I hope you'll do that, and I hope you'll join us again for the next session of Cafe Philosophy.